This video was sponsored by Morning Brew. Hey, Happy Friday. This week I went hands-on with a bunch of new Samsung devices as well as Android 13 and Apple got really creative with some App Store rates again. A quiz is also back this week along with 20 new questions for you to test your tech knowledge on. It is linked down in the description and welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, my release highlights this week only include one product, the Yip Tracker, which is the first dedicated pet tracker that works on both Apple's Find My network as well as Samsung's SmartThings network. It includes personalized engraving for you to put your contact details or your pet's name on it or something, and it starts at 35 USD. Pretty cool. Beside that, the only other interesting new devices this week were those from Samsung. I actually got to spend some hands-on time with those, so that will be my first story of the week. So Samsung has released six new devices this week, three in the S22 phone family and three in the Tab S8 tablet family, and for the most part, I'm quite excited about these. So first, the tablets. The massive 14.6-inch Ultra is ridiculous with its 120Hz OLED screen, quad speakers, S Pen support, Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, and more. It is the most extra Android tablet you can possibly get, and with the extra keyboard accessory and DeX, it is a massive computer and a drawing tablet all-in-one that can and also be used as an external monitor for a PC. Samsung said 20% of tablet sales worldwide are already 11 inches and above. The big screen tablet market is both growing faster than average and has higher prices, so that's why we got this monster. Weirdly, the Ultra is the only one of the three that also has a notch for its dual selfie cameras, while the others look similar to standard iPad Pros. The S Pen is included with all three and all have almost identical flagship specs, except that the smallest one of the bunch has an an LCD screen instead of an OLED. Oh well, still pretty cool overall. As for phones, the regular S22 and S22 Plus are your standard upgrades over last year's models, while the Ultra is really clearly Samsung's replacement for the Note series. I think every single one of the new colors looks straight up beautiful in real life. Both the flat edges of the S22 series and the curves of the Ultra feel great in hand. The screens are also ridiculously bright, with the Ultra and the Plus reaching a peak brightness of 1,750 nits. Samsung now promises four generations of Android updates on flagships, as well as five years of security patches, which is even better than the official Pixel support timelines, bravo. And Samsung finally also has new camera sensors too. Probably the most interesting one is the Ultra's new main sensor that is 23% bigger than last year's and can apparently flexibly adjust pixel binning on the fly. This means it can bin as many pixels as it wants depending on how dark it is, and Samsung also promised to then combine the bin shots with an extra 108 megapixel shot, so you get both the max detail and the extra brightness and noise reduction from the binning. I'll be giving my final thoughts on the cameras a bit later on, but it sure looks like on the hardware front, Samsung went all out in a year when competitors like OnePlus seem to be walking backwards and other competitors like Oppo seem to have abandoned ideas like periscope cameras completely. Perhaps the only potential disappointment, at least here in Europe, are the processors, as Samsung during our events at the Exynos 2200 only had a tiny increase in CPU and GPU performance over last year, with the NPU showing the only real big jump this year. My buddy Killian from I Know Review is in the process of benchmarking the Exynos right now, and he doesn't seem to think that it's as far behind the Snapdragon as those numbers seem to suggest, but it is clear that it is not the slam dunk that Samsung was hoping for, and it is also understandable while in some markets like India, the company actually went with the Snapdragon chip this year. Samsung apparently expects this series to sell much better than the S21 series, which performed poorly despite lower prices, and other than the chip, I can see why. The ultra especially looks like a real beast. Okay, my second story of the week will be that the first developer preview of Android 13 is here and I've already installed it on this Pixel 6. So this is an early build, of course, and its purpose is to let developers get it and understand how their app will perform in the final Android 13 release some months away. This whole Android 13 process starts now and it moves through developer previews, beta releases, and then a final release sometime later this year in around September or October. There's not too much to show visually yet and the build can be super buggy, of course, but if you have a spare Pixel phone lying around, I've left a link with instructions below. It is a remarkably simple process. Anyway, it's pretty clear that after the major design overhaul that came with Android 12, it looks like Android 13 will be a smaller update that rather applies another coat of polish and focuses on smaller improvements. 
From what I've seen so far, the main focus is on going further on privacy again, starting with a new system photo picker. This lets you select what specific photos and videos an app may have access to, instead of giving it full access to all the media on your device, like in previous Android builds. It is like a sandbox, and apparently the photo picker will later be ported over to older Android versions as well, with Google Play system updates, which is pretty cool. There are also dedicated quick tiles for a QR code reader, as well as one-handed mode now. Some of the animations seem slightly different across the Pixel UI. There's supposedly also a new Wi-Fi permission that allows apps to connect to Wi-Fi without also requesting location, meaning apps you may not want to access your location now won't get it. And then there are also themed icons, which means that any developer can now declare a dynamic app icon that switches colors automatically with material U settings, not just the system apps. And basically, that's it for now. Of course, with time, people will go through the UI and they'll dig out random little changes that we've missed so far, and Google will also keep adding new stuff until the final release. This is just the first build for developers for now. Okay, uh, my last story this week will be the incredible evil genius approach that Apple has taken to App Store payments in the Netherlands. The story starts with the fact that the Dutch Antitrust Authority forced Apple to let dating apps in the Netherlands use competing payment providers outside the App Store. That means Apple's 15 or 30% cut of in-app payments would be in jeopardy, which is of course what the Epic versus Apple lawsuit was about as well. So to counter that, Apple announced this week that it will simply charge a 20 7% fee for allowing alternative payments. And app developers will need to provide Apple with literally a list of all sales made through the App Store, and then Apple will simply invoice the developer for its 27% cut. In addition, a pop-up from Apple will attempt to spook users, warning them that they are leaving Apple's private and secure realm. Yep, I'm sure that's exactly what the Dutch authorities were going through, and of course Apple is fighting them so hard because if they let it pass once in one country, then all the other countries might get ideas as well, and that would hurt them massively on the long term. It's hard to argue that Apple or Google should get a 0%, but Apple's 27% approach was described by one developer as, quote, absolutely vile, and he also said that, quote, everybody on their executive team should be ashamed. I kind of agree, but I guess everybody at Apple probably just thinks they're very, very clever. Beside that, Apple has also released its new tap to pay service that lets you just pay friends or even businesses by tapping two iPhones together, no credit cards required. And this is one of the many news I first read about in Morning Brew, the free daily newsletter I read Monday to Sunday that covers tech, business, and whatever else is relevant. If you love the Friday checkout, Morning Brew covers similar topics, the writing is well researched and pops off the page, the highlights are all there, and it gets your day moving by being up to date. I read it while I drink my first cup of coffee in the morning, and I find that the fun tone and analysis alongside my dose of caffeine is an excellent way to start the day. Signing up to get it in your inbox takes just a few seconds, it is free, and there's really no reason not to sign up. Click on the link in the description and you'll be all set. 